Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me in the back? Okay, great. Welcome. Thank you for getting up early to attend our session. This panel responds to the call from over 170 Palestinian civil society organizations, including the largest teachers and professors union to support the boycott of Israeli academic institutions. Current events confirm once again the urgency of the need to end the occupation and its colonial expansion, as well as the apartheid laws that violate Palestinian rights. That includes home demolitions, as well as an escalation of Israeli settler and army violence against Palestinians just this fall, as we've seen. I want to call your attention to the report of the AAA Task Force on Israel-Palestine, which provides a devastating account of the human rights situation in Palestine. If you haven't taken a look at that, it's very accessible on the AAA website. The report, and I will quote this one part of it, states, there is a strong case for the association to take action on Israel-Palestine. The report also stated that censure alone is, quote, an insufficient course of action. We here today want to talk to you about why we think academic boycott of Israeli institutions is the best way to take action at this time. We are advocates of resolution number two, which will be voted on at the business meeting tomorrow night, Friday, at 6.15 p.m. in the convention center in the mile high ballrooms number two and three. <coughs> we urge you to vote yes on resolution two and no on resolution one. And we can always go through some of the differences of those in the Q&A uh, if any remaining issues remain unaddressed. But the way that I'm explaining it to people who wonder about the difference and have read resolution two that we support, say, well, how am I gonna remember one or two? And so I'm going with the cinephone. Ours goes further. So think of resolution number two as in T-O-O, -O, two. There are flyers in the back of the room with more information about our resolution, as well as frequently asked questions, a guideline, and highlights from the task force report. I wanna note that the cameras that you see rolling now have been approved uh, by the AAAS press policy. They're authorized recordings, and we ask that there be no unauthorized recordings. The AAAS press policy forbids them. I just want to have a, a, take another couple minutes here to um, highlight a few issues before I turn it over to Roberto, who will introduce our panelists. I have been very active in academic boycott, pardon me, in academic boycott since the founding of the U.S. Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, which was founded in the midst of Operation Cast Lead in those weeks covering late 2008, early 2009. And the American Studies Association Academic Boycott Resolution emerged from a small delegation that I was part of in January 2012 with Nefertiti Tadiar, Nikhil Singh, Robin D.G. Kelly, and Bill Mullen. And it was a U.S. ACTI delegation. Again, U.S. ACTI is the U.S. Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel. But the ASA was not the first association to pass an academic resolution. It was the Association of Humanistic Sociology that passed the first resolution in the United States, and that was in 2013. The, after that, the Association for Asian American Studies passed the next resolution, followed by the ASA. And then just a few weeks later, the Council of the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association declared uh, an endorsement for academic boycott. And I can speak in the Q&A if there's time and people have specific questions about sort of what that process looked like within the American Studies Association and NISA, the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association. But one of the things that I want to highlight is that connection around a critique of U.S. imperialism in the region as well as settler colonialism there and here, right? So not exceptionalizing American domination nor Israeli domination. One of the 
um, things that I found fascinating in terms of the work of academic boycott is a two-pronged charge. Um, one is that it violates the academic freedom of Israeli academics and that it's punitive. And I want to just speak to that very briefly in my introductory remarks here. When people have charged academic freedom or the violation of it, I have yet to hear an actual example that constitutes academic freedom. I endorse U.S. ACB as an individual, and that's different than our boycott resolution, which doesn't bind any individuals at all. It's institution to institution, so it's the institution of the AAA in relation to academic institutions in 48 Israel. But let's use the individual example for a moment. There's nothing to say that I couldn't or wouldn't co-edit a book or an article with a colleague at Ben Gurion University or Tel Aviv University. I regularly have actual academic exchange and intellectual collaboration with scholars who do come to NISA and ASA. And so the idea that my withholding of my presence at those institutions as an individual scholar somehow constitutes a violation of their academic freedom to me seems quite twisted. And then you couple that with the notion that it's punitive, and I think, wow, people are really feeling violated and punished if I don't go to Tel Aviv University and give a lecture on Hawaiian sovereignty? You know, I'd like to think I'm a good lecturer, but I don't want to think that that would, you know, be really a hardship for someone if they didn't hear me give a talk. So, you know, why do people see it as a form of punishment rather than a withholding? You know, what if we frame this as an issue of consent, right? that I will withhold my presence in the institution. I don't consent to actually partaking in this in that way. And for that reason, I do see academic boycott as moving beyond merely symbolic politics. I think of it as important work of anti-normalization, uh, even as it's grounded in normative international law. And I think anti-normalization is where it's at. And I think it's also important to recall, or for those of you who may be unfamiliar, to note that the BDS committee the Palestinian civil society call for BDS broadly for boycott, divestment, and sanctions comes a year after the call for academic and cultural boycott. Academic and cultural boycott precedes the broader BDS call by one full year. And so if we're paying attention as anthropologists to what people on the ground, as people like to point out, on the ground, are asking the rest of the world to do is to honor that academic and cultural boycott and now as a broader part of BDS. Lastly, for now, I want to read something very brief. I received an email this morning at 6 a.m. as I was waking up making my hotel coffee, and I need to not identify the sender, but this is someone who is based in an Israeli academic institution, one of those subject to the call for boycott. They wrote, I hope all is well with you. I'm sending this to you, assuming that you're at the AAA right now. I wrote a brief statement, see below, that I hope you might be willing to distribute in relation to the business meeting on Friday. I want the statement to reach people who might not want to vote for the resolution that you're advancing. That's resolution number two. Since this action constitutes a violation of Israeli law on my part, I ask for strict, strict confidentiality. If you decide to distribute or share it with others, it must be absolutely anonymous. And this is that statement that they wrote. Some people are reluctant to support the academic boycott of Israeli universities because of the common belief that it might hurt progressive forces within these institutions who should instead be strengthened so they could transform Israeli society from within. I am an Israeli academic closely familiar with progressives in Israeli academe. Time and again, in the face of systematic violations of Palestinian rights within the academy and beyond it, almost all progressive academics here have chosen to protect their own institutions rather than, than use their positions to reform these institutions and the wider Israeli society. Particularly in the context of Palestinian rights, Israeli progressivism functions more like a badge of honor than as commitment to action-oriented political stance. Thus, Israeli progressives should not be seen as victims of the academic boycott. Rather, they have much to gain from it because external pressure will encourage them to choose between loyalty to the state and substantial action for human rights. 
the defense of progressive Israelis, much like the charge of anti-Semitism, is used to stifle debate and perpetuate the status quo, and it should be recognized as such." End quote. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Roberto now, who will introduce our panelists. Thank you. This morning in my introductory remarks, I will give some background information about the current situation in Israel-Palestine, and then offer my thoughts about the significance of the proposed academic boycott of Israeli institutions. Afterwards, I'll introduce our speakers. Let me begin by saying that violence does not occur in a vacuum. It emerges from specific historical and cultural contexts. In Israel-Palestine, violence is rooted in Israel's decades-long military occupation of Palestinian territories and the expansion of Jewish settlements in these areas, including East Jerusalem. Military occupation and settler colonialism are by definition coercive, and in Palestine, these processes have often been brutal. Over the years, dozens of UN Security Council resolutions have criticized Israeli violations of the Geneva Conventions, the UN Charter, and other international laws. The past 18 months have been marked by intensified violence. In July and August 2014, Israeli attacks on Gaza killed 2,300 Palestinians and injured 10,000 more. According to the UN, more than two-thirds of the casualties were civilians. 71 Israelis also died, the vast majority soldiers. The pattern by now is predictable. Death, destruction, reprisal, counter-reprisal, and more death and destruction. The latest round of violence began six weeks ago. The corporate media would have us believe that religious extremists are inciting Palestinians to attack Israeli Jews with stones, knives, and cars. These sources would also have us believe that Palestinians are angered by the possibility that the Israeli government may soon allow Jews to pray at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. In the official narrative, social media is an autonomous force radicalizing Palestinian youths. For those reciting the official narrative, history only begins yesterday. They ignore the longer range of history that made it possible for us to arrive at the current situation. The official narrative minimizes or disregards entirely the, the Israeli state's role in creating the conditions for violence. Netanyahu's government, like those before it, has claimed that it has the right to build homes for Israeli Jews anywhere it wants, including in East Jerusalem, and it has. The results have been devastating. In 1995, there were approximately 150,000 Jews in East Jerusalem. Today, there are more than half a million. Palestinians are being squeezed out of their homes by Israeli policies that limit family reunification, redraw Jerusalem's municipal boundaries, and expand Jewish settlements. Jeff Halper calls it a matrix of control, a web of infrastructural, bureaucratic, and ideological mechanisms that are incrementally undermining the viability of Palestine. But beyond matrices of control, beyond Kafkaesque rules and regulations, beyond violations of international law, behind the Orwellian silent transfer of Palestinians are human beings. Extreme criminality and violence make it easy to forget just who is being affected. While keeping track of statistics and body counts is important, it's also important to keep individual lives in focus. Perhaps the most shocking thing about the events of the last six weeks is not the fact that most victims are Palestinian. That, after all, has been a consistent pattern. But that approximately half of the victims have been teenagers. The last six weeks have been, among other things, a war on Palestinian youth. The median age of the 88 Palestinians killed by Israeli military, police, and settlers since October 1st is 19 years old. To put a human face on the Israeli Defense Force's disproportionate attacks, we could talk about the youngest victim, two-year-old Rahaf Hassan, who was killed on October 11th with her mother when the family's house collapsed following an Israeli airstrike near Gaza City. It's a stark reminder of the unevenness of the two sides the life of an innocent toddler, cut short by a missile launched from a US-made, US-financed General Dynamics F-16 fighter plane from thousands of feet above. I would like to spend a moment reflecting upon the life and death of another Palestinian youth, 16-year-old Ishak Badran, who was fatally shot by Israeli police on October 10th. I think it reveals much about how daily injustices, 
and indignities of occupation drive a cycle of violence. Most Israeli and Western media outlets predictably wrote him off as a terrorist because he stabbed an Israeli man. But the story is more complex. Ishak Badran, a resident of East Jerusalem, was an 11th grader in an Israeli vocational high school who enjoyed soccer and swimming. He was the oldest of six children. Ishak was deeply upset by an incident in which an Israeli settler attempted to remove the hijab of a Muslim woman in Jerusalem's old city. According to his father, Ishak spoke to his mother about the incident and cried, saying, no one is defending these women. Ishak prayed at the Mohammed al-Fatih Mosque. After his death, the mosque's muezzin marked that young people like Ishak, who were born after the 1993 Oslo Agreement that established Palestinian self-rule but failed to end Israeli occupation, are something of a lost generation. In his words, the US, Britain, Israel and the Palestinian Authority thought that in the last 20 years these children would adapt to their ways, that they would contain them, but this did not happen, he said. The justice motive can sometimes override even the most hegemonic controlling processes. Using the sociological imagination, we can come to a better understanding of the biographical details of Ishak Badran's truncated life as they intersected with historical facts beyond his control that were decades in the making a half century of military occupation, the slow motion process of ethnic cleansing, institutionalized racism, and economic subjugation. Ishak Badran was, in other words, a boy who witnessed intolerable insults, indignities, and injury, and at some level, internalized this pain. Children learn what they live, not just in the United States, but also in East Jerusalem. None of this is to, not, to, to deny that Israeli Jews are also experiencing death, devastation, and pain. But it is important to understand that their experiences are just as much the result of a vicious circle originating in Israeli military occupation and settlement expansion. In the time that I have left, I want to address the question of why our association should support a boycott of Israeli academic institutions. First, we are at a crucial historical moment the BDS movement, now in existence for more than a decade, is accelerating globally. A growing number of student governments, including the associated students of my own San Jose State University, have passed resolutions calling for their universities to divest themselves of investments in Israel. In spring 2013, the Association for Asian American Studies voted to support a boycott of Israeli institutions, followed by the American Studies Association in December 2013. If the AAA votes to approve a pro-boycott pro resolution, that is, resolution number two, it would become the largest academic association to do so in this country. The rationale for such boycotts is straightforward, and we'll get into that later this morning. Uh, first, Israeli universities and other institutions function as key components in a system that has denied fundamental rights to Palestinians. Students and faculty who protest Israeli policies are subjected to surveillance or retaliation or worse, while Palestinian students routinely face discrimination. Furthermore, Israeli academic institutions have remained silent about military occupation and new settlements. A second reason we should support the boycott against Israeli academic institutions is because we are an American anthropological association. Most of our organization's members are US citizens and taxpayers and our government has been deeply complicit. Since 1949, Israel has received more than $120 billion in foreign aid far more than any other country. In the last fiscal year, Israel received more than $3 billion in US foreign military financing. And it has been widely reported that in his visit to the US earlier this month, Benjamin Netanyahu was seeking an increase to $5 billion annually. To the extent that the AAA is an American institution, we should support the boycott. Finally, the boycott resolution is in keeping with the AAA's commitment to human rights. It is in this spirit that the AAA members passed a resolution condemning the Iraq War in 2006 and other resolutions since then. In 1999, the members of the association adopted the Declaration on Anthropology and Human, and Human Rights, which among other things states, quote, as a professional organization of anthropologists, the AAA has long been and should continue to be concerned whenever human difference is made the basis for a denial of basic human rights. The AAA founds its approach on anthropological principles of respect for concrete human differences, working on a definition built on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other treaties which bring human, basic human rights 
within the parameters of international law and practice, end quote. As we engage in this roundtable discussion this morning, I hope that we can keep our association's commitment to human rights in mind. And now I would like to introduce our speakers this morning. First, we will have Nadia Abu El Hajj. Nadia Abu El Hajj is professor in the departments of anthropology at Barnard College and Columbia University and co-director of the Center for Palestine Studies at Columbia. She is the author of two books, Facts on the Ground, Archaeological Practice and Territorial Self-Fashioning in Israeli Society, and The Genealogical Science, The Search for Jewish Origins and the Politics of Epistemology. She will speak about academic freedom as a way of setting up a framework for our discussion this morning. Lisa Rofel is our second speaker. She is professor of anthropology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She is also director of the Center for Emerging Worlds. She has published and edited five books, including Other Modernities, Gendered Yearnings in China After Socialism, and Desiring China, Experiments in Neoliberalism, Sexuality, and Public Culture. She is currently working on a set of essays about rethinking Zionism, ethno-nationalism, and settler colonialism. Our third speaker will be David Lloyd. David Lloyd is Distinguished Professor of English at the University of California, Riverside, and the founding member of the US Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel. He has published several books, including most recently, Irish Culture and Colonial Modernity, The Transformation of Oral Space. He has also published many articles on Palestine, Israel, including In the Long Shadow of the Settler on Israeli and US Colonialisms, co-written with Laura Pulido, and Settler Colonialism and the State of Exception, the example of Israel-Palestine. And with that, I will turn the microphone over to Nadia Abu El Hajj. I'm not to print of things, but um, I'm not sure I'm going to entirely uh, fulfill my duty of focusing entirely on academic freedom, but I will do a job. Okay, academic freedom, that is one of the calls of, of BDS. That is, it is a call for academic freedom for Palestinian universities, students, and scholars. As the Anthropology Task Force's own report documented in detail, today there is no such thing. Universities are raided on a regular basis, students arrested on campus, permits and visas denied, to Gazan students wanting to study in the West Bank, to foreign scholars wanting to come to teach at Palestinian universities, and to Palestinian scholars and students who wish to go abroad. There are material reasons why BDS has taken up or put the academy as one central node in its struggle. The effects of destroying education are long term. But I would also not underestimate its symbolic value. At the end of apartheid, various critics went back and revisited the question of the academic boycott and argued that research itself went along largely unaffected. By implication, the academic boycott was, as people referred to it, merely symbolic. As anthropologists, however, we know well that the symbolic, that the symbolic does not carry the weight of the mirror. It too has powerful material effects. So I thought I would begin today by recalling some of the some by recalling the anti-apartheid struggle, and what the parameters of their call for academic and cultural boycott in what was. So the ANC had already started calling for a boycott of South African institutions and its economy in 1958. It was a long time before that movement took global hold, especially in the, in the U.S. But once it did, it became a powerful tool against the apartheid re regime. So what were the demands of the cultural and academic boycott? I will not re-rehearse all of them here, but I want to point to, to some key ones that are very different than the demands put forward by BDS. And I focus on those because so much of the argument against the boycott here at the AAA as well as elsewhere seems to either misunderstand the call or to deliberately misrepresent it. As explained in an article published in 1995, the academic boycott of South Africa was intended, quote, to isolate scholars in South Africa by depriving them of the formal and informal sources of information needed for their future research and the conduits through which they could bring their own work to the attention of the international community, unquote. So how was that to be achieved? Not, um, 
Not only did the boycott ask that international scholars not travel to South African academic institutions, and yes, that is a key call of BDS, but they also called for the following. First, that international scholars and institutions do not invite South African scholars abroad. Second, that they refuse to publish South African manuscripts in journals and publishing houses, et cetera. Third, that they refuse to collaborate with South African scholars on research. Fourth, that international conferences such as this one bar South African scholars from attending. And fifth, that institutions abroad refuse to recognize South African degrees. As I know from a dear friend who was involved in the South African struggle, exceptions for specific individuals were at times made on the basis of effectively a political litmus test, but they were made as exceptions and only under the authority of the ANC. Now let us be clear, those are demands that make no distinction whatsoever between individual scholars and their scholarship and the institutions in which they work. Palestine's BDS has made a very different choice. We can and do invite Israeli scholars abroad. While we are asked not to publish in Israeli journals or publishing houses, Israelis will not be blocked from publishing their scholarship here. Research collaboration can continue, and BDS has not even demanded that Israeli scholars refuse to, f refuse to use funds from their own institutions or government. In other words, there is no demand here that Israeli scholars boycott their own universities, only that they respect the call for others to do so. In effect, this is a boycott call that is bent over backwards as far as it possibly can to protect the academic freedom and the scholarship of Israeli scholars. And let's be clear, it is bent over backwards to protect the academic freedom of scholars who already have it mm -hmm. in a reality when Palestinian scholars do not. So where do we go from here? In other words, how might we want to think about the disagreement between those of us calling for the, upon the AAA to sign on to the boycott and those of us here at the AAA who have proposed an alternative? I want to leave you with a few thoughts. And they are thoughts that reach not just to political choices we face, but to ethical ones. The alternative being pro proposed to the AAA pr puts forth what its author authors see as a more constructive alternative to a boycott, although I personally think it is just more of the status quo. But it strikes me that neither my opinion nor theirs is really the point. No matter what we might think of the productivity or not of dialogue, or the value of offering financial support for Palestinian academics and students, or for studying Palestine, some of the proposals put forth by this, um, the first resolution, the anti-boycott resolution, no matter what we might think of those proposals, that is not what is being asked of us by those suffering the harms of, Israeli's racial, of Israel's racial regime. Mm -hmm. In fact, to be very clear, it is what b is being asked of us by those who benefit from that regime. In other words, Palestinian academics are firmly behind BDS, and they are asking us to stand in solidarity with them. Like South Africa before it, the Israeli state and its academy has cultural, intellectual, and material ties to the West in general, and to the U.S. in particular, that renders boycotts effective in ways that they would not be vis-a-vis -vis other regimes. For example, I would be all for boycotting Syrian universities if a damn bit of difference that could make. And I would be all for answering a call to stand in solidarity with Iraqis and Afghans if there were a movement calling for a boycott of, univers of U.S. universities. That is, if we lived in a world in which that might have an impact on the reigning imperial violence of the U.S. state. But those are not the questions before us. The question we face is clear. As U.S. Academics, academics, that is as citizens or residents in a country whose exceptional relationship with Israel enables its ever spiraling racial violence to continue unchecked, are we going to heed the call of Israeli academics and their supporters in the U.S., even if they are critics of the regime, to back their strategy, even if theirs is a strategy that is not supported by those whose rights they claim to be defending? Or are we gonna heed the call for an academic boycott made by a broad, nonviolent Palestinian political movement that has lost all faith in the possibility of dialogue or intellectual bridges as a solution to the political crisis? Second, nothing in the boycott call precludes the possibility of dialogue or building intellectual bridges or for that matter, scholarly exchange. We've talked about that already. Our Israeli colleagues can still publish in our journals, as I said above, come to conferences such as this, and even do research and publish with anthropologists elsewhere, 
and they can do so on Israeli university and government funding. For that matter, the AAA can make a decision to continue allowing Israeli universities to have access to their online publications. If that is a decision, we make in support of anthrop anthropologists as scholars, as individual scholars in the Israeli academy. And BDS is not hiding a deeper truth, which is a lot of what be, we're being accused of doing. An understanding of what an, uh, an academic boycott should and should not entail developed and shifted over the years out of conversations and arguments in which many an academic both here and in Palestine were involved. And in the end, the boycott came to focus on institutions and not individuals. Yes, that is not a pure distinction. Yes, there will be a small price that individual Israeli anthropologists will pay. But I don't know what it means to call oneself a critic of the state or to claim to be a progressive if one is not willing to bear any price for one's politics? Should the defense of privilege really extend that far? And before anyone accuses me of being willing to risk the academic privilege of others, many a Palestinian academic in the US and many others who have written critically about Israel and Palestine have paid and continue to pay a price here. That is the risk one takes. Third, Perhaps we should all have a little more humility about the world historical importance of our scholarship and discipline. There's a lot of the, of the anti-boycott call saying that as anthropologists, what we do is bring understanding to the world, et cetera. Yeah, what we do matters, maybe. But perhaps it doesn't matter all that much. The call for a boycott is a political call. It's a call for us to think about something that might matter more than our discipline, our research, and for that matter, our academic careers. I would hope that we would have the ability to stand back and see the bigger picture. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, this, this is it. Oh. OK. I am uh, sick and tired, sick and tired of the accusation of anti-Semitism against those of us who support the boycott campaign. And I want to speak to that accusation. I support this boycott as a Jew, as someone who grew up as an Orthodox religious Jew, and as someone who was taught by my socialist Orthodox rabbi that Judaism stands for social justice. It's my passionate support of this boycott comes from my belief that Judaism now stands, at least as represented by Israel, stands for the opposite. And it's my support for boycott is my call to Judaism to live up to its promise of social justice, that that's what we stand for. It's taken me a long, 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 long time to get to this position. I grew up as an ardent supporter of Israel no matter what. We all had that position, what I call Israel, no matter what it does. We were taught uh, that these, all these Arabs, we were not allowed to call them Palestinians, we didn't even use that term, all these Arabs were terrorists. Uh, we were taught that they were just Arabs and could go to any of the other Arab countries. Why do they need Palestine? Which was in itself a perverted admission that Israel was taking their land. Uh, we were taught that they hated Jews and that this was just part of a long line of anti-Jewish racism that ran all the way from the expulsion from Spain in 1492 all the way to the present, one long line of anti-Semitism. So it's taken me a long time to unlearn those ideological messages and to learn what actually, actually is the truth of what's going on in the ground with the Israeli occupation. And I have to say, it's really personally extremely painful for me. As a Jew, to change the way you think about Israel as an American Jew is not like deciding to vote Republican instead of Democrat. It's really about pulling your insides out and rethinking what you thought you were and what you think is going on there. We were taught to identify so closely with Israel in all ways that we conducted our lives as Jews in the United States. And it's been a long unlearning process for me. 
Um, and I feel really strongly that we need, as Jews, to support the boycott, uh, certainly as American citizens and certainly as anthropologists. Uh, I cannot abide by what this Israeli occupation has led to. The task force report on the incredible, what they called petty bureaucratic cruelty in the ways that the Israeli government restricts Palestinian academic freedom is very eloquent, very eloquent. Even books are hard to get a hold of, let alone the fact in 2014, Israel took advantage of bombing Gaza to bomb 141 schools, some of them in the West Bank. They've closed Birzeit University for a total of nine years over the past 15 years. Uh, not to mention what they do to Palestinian students in Israeli universities. All of this, in my view, is unconscionable, unconscionable. We cannot live with this any longer. Uh, part of the charge of anti-Semitism has to do with the idea that why are we picking on Israel? So that's a common refrain, why are we picking on Israel? I've thought long and hard about that objection. And I feel that there are several answers to that. But the main one is when people say, why are you picking on Israel? They already assume we're talking about a land for Jews only and completely erasing the presence of Palestinians in that question. This is an internal call for boycott, internal to the Israeli occupation. There's no part of Palestine, really, that's not under Israeli occupation, let alone Palestinians living within the 67 borders. This is an internal call. So when you say, why pick on Israel, I want to turn the question around. Those who object to why pick on Israel need to defend the fact that they want to continue a regime of racial hierarchy that spawns racial violence, a regime in which Jews have special rights that others do not have. I want to hear a defense of that regime. Recently, at a conference at UCLA, Sari Makdisi said that he feels much more comfortable being in conversation with Israeli Jews who are quite willing to admit what's going on on the ground, but still support a Jewish state. That they're much more honest than a lot of American Jews who hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. That we live in an ideological bubble in which we refuse to recognize what is actually going on on the ground. Once you recognize what is actually going on on the ground, if you then want to support a Jewish state that is a democracy for Jews only, that's a racial hierarchy, then that's a position you take. But this is not about picking on Israel. This is actually the fact that because of US support, we have been unable to criticize Israel, unable to make anything happen, and that's why we have come to this boycott. This is a grassroots, ground up, international campaign to finally, finally make Israel recognize full Palestinian rights, both within the 67 borders, uh, outside, but within the occupation, and the right of refugees to return. This is a grassroots campaign, mainly because of the role the US government has played in supporting whatever it is that Israel does, under the name of dialogue since the Oslo Accords. Dialogue has been that way of maintaining the status quo. Recently, as some of you know, I do research in China. <coughs> Israel <coughs> has been becoming very close, the Israeli government, to the Chinese government. They've been selling them a lot of weapons. So I wanted, I have been trying to start a conversation in China to let them know about this boycott campaign. So I had a small meeting with a few of my intellectual friends who were on the left in China recently to discuss how I could start this uh, conversation going in China just to let people know what is actually going on here, which is not getting reported in the Chinese press. And uh, one of those people then interviewed me and wanted to publish that interview. But another person who is on the left in China, then after I left 
after I left China and came back to the United States, told her not to do that and that they can't discuss the boycott issue in China. And so now we're thinking of other ways to do this. But what was so eerie about that is that it really echoes what's going on in Israel. So they have criminalized speech about boycott. So I found the resonance with China completely uh, <laughs> telling and eerie. So I support the boycott. I've come to this position over many years. Uh, and I think it's really clear to all of us that this is the only way to really put international nonviolent pressure on Israel to end its violation of Palestinian human rights. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to the organizers of this panel for inviting me to be here. Um, particularly, thank you to those members of AAA who have moved this boycott resolution in the way that you have. Uh, we are moving a similar resolution through the Modern Language Association right now, and I can tell you that we are leaping to emulate your example and the extraordinary cogency with which you proceeded. It's almost to the day, six years and two further violent incursions since Israel's Operation Cast Lead reigned the firepower of one of the world's most advanced military forces on the open air prison of Gaza. Then some 1,400 Palestinians, mostly civilians, were killed in that act of collective punishment and at least 23 educational institutions were destroyed or severely damaged. In response to this extraordinarily disproportionate offensive, the US Congress passed a Senate resolution in support of Israel that was a tissue of mendacity and half-truths. Only four very courageous representatives dissented. In the summer of 2014, after a campaign that killed 2,400 Gazans uh, residents, none dissented. Appalled at the brutality of caste lead, and observing the utter closure of the political sphere to any serious criticism of Israel's policies and practices, a number of US academics concluded that it was time to endorse the Palestinian call for the boycott of Israeli academic and cultural institutions and invited their colleagues to do likewise. As you heard, Keolani was part of that uh, organizing commencement. Where the political process is blocked by money, power or influence, we have no option but to activate a civil society movement to educate and change the discourse. The divestment movement did that in the 1980s when the Reagan administration was committed to what it called constructive engagement with South Africa. Now, six years since Cast led, several scholarly associations, as you know, including the, Asian, the American Studies Association, the Association for Asian American Studies, and the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association, together with many religious groups and now trades unions, have endorsed that call for boycott and begun to prove the effectiveness of such a grassroots movement. In the furious response to such endorsements, with their resort to authoritarianism, intimidation, and spurious legal threats, what the boycott actually calls for has been misrepresented, as you've already heard, sometimes deliberately and maliciously. But you will know, whether you've read the ASA statement, or those of PACB itself, or those now produced by the AAA's boycott proponents, that what is called for is a boycott of institutions whose complicity in Israel's regime of discrimination, occupation, and dispossession is a matter of very well-documented record. Complicity is not a vague charge, but a description of the operative involvement of Israeli institutions of all kinds, but not excluding its universities, in the maintenance and furthering of occupation, dispossession, and discrimination against Palestinians. Universities do not and should not get a free pass in the name of an academic freedom they neither respect nor uphold when it comes to Palestinian scholars and students. Nonetheless, as you've heard, 
The boycott does not call for and does not espouse the boycott of individual faculty in Israel or anywhere else. Not only does it not prevent intellectual and scholarly exchanges, it positively encourages them. Indeed, since the movement for an academic boycott has gained visibility, public discussion and debate about the issue that was too long the third rail of academia as well as of politics has become not only possible, but even normal. Is it this discussion that Israel and its supporters see as such an existential threat, as they call it? In the short time that I have, I don't wish to defend the boycott movement, a nonviolent, human rights-based movement for freedom, equality, and justice, one that opposes a regime of exceptional and systemic inequity, exclusion, dispossession, and brazen colonial expansion needs no defense. But I do want to say what I think this movement actually represents. The call for BDS, issued by the overwhelming majority of Palestinian civil society movements in 2005, takes seriously the fundamental moral and political principle that rights cannot be doled out in full to some and only partially to the others, whether on the basis of ethnicity, religion, or any other ascription of identity. Accordingly, BDS seeks the recognition of the human and civil rights of all Palestinians, those in the occupied and blockaded West Bank and Gaza, those within Israel, and those in exile in the diaspora. The furious outcry that insists that to turn to the time-honored strategy of boycott infringes on the academic freedoms of Israeli scholars serves to disguise what should be the glaring outrage that the freedoms of Palestinians, and not only their academic freedoms, are daily violated to maintain the privileges of one ethno-religious group. More insidiously, on account of this simple and surely unexceptional demand to be considered fully human and therefore deserving of rights, BDS has been accused of covertly intending the destruction of the state of Israel with all the connotations of genocide or expulsion that that phrase more or less openly invokes. But if a state cannot exist without the denial of those rights, as even liberal Zionists now admit, then surely it is for that state to justify itself and not for the movement that pursues those rights to do so. But it's no secret that what BDS seeks is no more and no less than Israel's transformation. It asks Israel actually to be what it pretends to be, a normal democracy, a state of and for all its people, and a state that respects its obligations under international law and human rights norms. It does not ask anyone to leave or to accept less than equal rights. It asks only the Jewish citizens of Israel be willing to live on equal terms with non-Jewish citizens, with the Palestinian citizens of that state, whether Muslim, Christian, or secular, and to live in a land that belongs to all its citizens free of legalized racial discrimination. That would be real belonging rather than colonial settlement. This is an invitation, not a threat. It's an invitation to Israelis, and indeed to all people, to realize the emancipatory potential embedded in every struggle for justice and in every act of local or international solidarity with those struggles. It's an invitation to free oneself from the painful contradiction of advocating democracy and defending and supporting oppression. It's an invitation to step out of the meshes of a colonial Zionist project that has become a nightmare ever more rigid and repressive, and to embrace the possibilities and the risks that true democracy entails. It is, for all of us, an invitation to bring home the lessons of the Palestinian struggle for the right to education, freedom, and justice, and to fight for those here also. Settler colonialism is a system of differential privilege. We should recall that for any peace process to begin, white South Africans had to stand down from their exclusionary racial privileges. In Northern Ireland too, Protestants had to relinquish their monopoly on rule in order for peace processes to begin. Some have called these the costs of peacemaking. Perhaps it would be better to think of them as the gifts peace brings to those 
willing to contemplate cohabitation in a just society based on real equality. Furthermore, in my experience over the last few years, to receive that gift has already been an intellectual as well as a political lesson. Over and over again, working in and with the boycott movement has confirmed something that one already knew, if only as a supposition. Activism is not only the extension of thinking into the world, but the reciprocal transformation of our thought by an active engagement with that world. A movement like BDS that is growing and adapting even in the face of increasingly ugly efforts to repress it and all it stands for, obliges invention and creativity. It becomes, as I have witnessed again and again, and I'm witnessing once more here at AAA, the crucible for new thinking about ends and outcomes, possibilities and potentialities. Unlike Zionism, BDS is not becoming ossified and rigid, but continues to reach beyond itself, to critique its own suppositions, to imagine what it could be, not only for Palestinians, but for all of us to live otherwise. Such for me is the full meaning of the boycott. Thank you. Thank you so much to all our panelists. I also would like to um, acknowledge and thank Laura Deeb who, organ who organized this session and is listed in the program. We can now move to Q&A. There's a microphone in the middle of the room. I'll ask that people please identify themselves and speak up so that everyone can hear and to please keep comments to a minimum and questions short. And um, I'll stay up here, but I do want to remind people there are copies of the resolution as well as FAQs or frequently asked questions sheets in the back, as well as a sheet with highlights from the AAA task force report. Anybody want to step up? My name is Mark Westmoreland. Um, I'm at Leiden University. Say I, again, sorry, your name? Mark Westmoreland, Leiden University. Um, I'm an advocate for uh, resolution number two, but when I speak with certain friends who are not, one of the questions I get is, or the comments, is that this will have no effect. That, and even maybe playing off of a little bit of what uh, Professor al Haj said, as anthropologists, do we really make a difference? So I'm wondering how the panelists might respond to the effect that we might have with such a resolution. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I can add to whatever two of you. There you go. Hello, is it on? Oh. Um, first of all, I want to be clear that what I was talking about is the defense of sort of substantive scholarship, that what we can contribute by continuing research and kind of coming to understand the situation is more important than taking political action. Look, I, the AAA on its own, making a decision to boycott Israeli academic institutions, of course, would have no effect. There are two things that I would keep in mind. It's part of a growing movement, and more and more associations have been doing it. Um, and I think what has really struck me about BDS over the past decade is it has had a cumulative effect and it's beginning to have a, a momentum that I would never have predicted. So if we were the one institution making this decision, who cares? But it is part of a movement that is, um, that I think is very powerful politically and symbolically because if nothing else, it, it's really beginning to be able to shift the public conversation. Right? Can we really talk critically about Israel? Can we think about Israel as a racial state? What does that mean? And what kinds of obligations we have, particularly from sitting in the US, towards that? Um, the other thing I wanted to say is, there, are, in the last few days, it's quite extraordinary. The Israeli press has picked this up. Channel 10 had this long report about it. This morning, Haaretz had an op-ed about it. Part of it, I think, is being placed strategically. But there is a sense that there is a sense of panic about this, and it's, it's certainly a panic, that, I mean, the Netanyahu government has about uh, the movement as a whole, but in that panic, they're not excluding um, the academic boycott as insignificant versus the other things. Clearly, an economic divestment will have much more profound impact, if 
it ever happened substantively, but it is part of um, sort of a, a, it is part of, it is, it is part of a, a movement to think about what it means to isolate the state and for them to feel isolated, even if primarily symbolically from an academic point of view. So I don't actually think it has no effect. And I think if it really had no effect, we wouldn't be getting the pushback we're getting. Mm -hmm. David? Uh, let me just endorse everything that Nadia just said and add a couple of things. Uh, starting with what she last said, um, you can measure the effect of any movement by the amount of coercion that is directed at, at it in order to silence it. Um, the Israeli government, and not just American Zionist organizations, have targeted BDS. Uh, Netanyahu's cabinet elevated BDS to a strategic threat about a year ago, placing it second only after a nuclear-armed Iran in terms of so-called existential threats to uh, Israel. That's not to sort of say, oh, look how mighty we are, on, on the contrary. Um, but what it is to say is that the argument that it's merely symbolic, and again, I refer back to what Nadia said, uh, is very misleading. The impact of the sports boycott on South Africa may in fact have been psychologically far more important than the economic boycott because it was through sports that South Africa felt itself to be connected to the world of Western European democracy and other settler colonial enterprises like in the Commonwealth. And the cutting off of relationships to sport was really crucial. Israel's self-image, its sort of ego ideal, if you like, is intimately wrapped up with its academic prowess and its integration in the research and scholarship world of, the, of Western democracies. To go after that is actually to impose a, a caution on Israeli scholars of a very, very deep kind, and indeed on Israeli society as a whole. And one of the points about a boycott movement is that it can only really be applied to societies that believe that they actually have a, an open democratic sphere. There's no point in trying to boycott China because you know, it is ruled from the top down and it has therefore very little impact on a civil society that could affect anything. That may change and, and you know, we may be engaging in a boycott of China over, over Tibet. At the moment, as Nadia said, that's really not effective. Israel's having a democratic society, or at least believing it has a democratic society, even as it infringes every tenet of a democracy, means that to be integrated in that Western democratic cultural sphere is crucial. So the symbolic effect is actually profoundly practical in this instance. And I would just also add, I, I personally agree with both of those points, but also this is why I mentioned the fact that PACBI, the Palestinian Academic and Cultural Boycott, that is the, the campaign that responded to and responds to this day to Palestin, Palestinian civil society's call for academic and cultural boycott predates the broader BDS call by a year. Right, so PACB was founded in 2004 and the broader BDS campaign in 2005. That tells us that Palestinian civil society has identified this as a priority. And so that question around effectiveness, also I think short cuts or short circuits a recognition that Palestinian people themselves have asked for this and they've thought it through. And so in a sense, who are we to say what's effective or not? And I do agree with the the issue around the, the charge of merely symbolic is, is really just kind of a joke at this point. If, if you looked at even just the backlash against the American Studies Association, you've got Netanyahu's legal response. You also had three different states trying to move immediately in their legislatures to produce punitive, right? Who's really doing the punishing, right? Who's really breaching academic freedom? But the punitive piece is really intense and that's a response. But I think the effectiveness, again, who's looking at who's authority in this to identify what they think actually needs to happen on the ground. Other questions? And people can line up. That's fine if you want to come up. I see people back there. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Les Field from the uh, University of New Mexico. And I want to thank the panel. I think this is an amazing panel. Um, I'm a supporter of BDS, but I think the panel did an extraordinary job of making um, uh, the case in a, in a much more profound and much more thoroughgoing and really thought-provoking manner. 
for uh, all sorts of aspects of, of BDS and, and, and the challenges to it. And so um, in that light, I want to ask this question. And um, I'm also a person uh, raised in a, in a, on the borderline between conservative and orthodox Judaism and, um, and uh, really appreciated uh, Dr. Rofel's remarks about what that takes to, to challenge that and, and, um, and, and how that process takes place. And so um, I guess what, what I'm asking about is a process in, in Spanish we call conscientización, consciousness raising, whether the panel could share um, with us uh, in their conversations with other people, people who react to BDS negatively or who are supporters of Israel, what have been that moments of consciousness raising? Where, what have you experienced uh, that uh, those moments when people have changed their minds and how that has worked? For me, it was my work in Latin America, starting in Nicaragua in, in the late 1970s and seeing the effects of Israeli foreign policy in Latin America and the alignment between Israel and the right-wing regimes in Argentina, in Guatemala, in Nicaragua, et cetera. That's, that's what brought me to a different level of consciousness about Israel and, and brought me to Palestine, really. Um, and so I'm wondering if the panel could share with us moments in their interactions with other people of consciousness raising and, and how that worked. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to say something? Oh, I, I have things to say too, but please, I defer to the panel. Um, Thank you, Les, that was a really good question. Um, the people I talk with don't all often come back to me uh, to tell me exactly how they have shifted, but I can see by who's been signing the pro-boycott resolution that people I have talked with have shifted. And I have to say, uh, both for Jews and, and non-Jews, um, um, most, a, a lot of people were not paying attention and uh, for a long time, unless you actively sought out information about the Israeli occupation, there was not a lot of reporting. Um, and so I, I can't thank enough the Anthropology Association's task force for doing a thorough reporting about the effects of the occupation. Uh, but. Um, so that's within the association. People can now have that information. But in general, um, I think what has happened since I've been talking to people is that they have sought out the information. They simply did not know. And that is a huge shift, huge, that they seek out the information and they actually pay attention to what's actually going on on the ground. And then, as I say, if they still want to support a regime for Jews only, that's then a position they take. But once you find that information, I've seen a lot of anthropologists in particular shift their position from being against boycott to signing the boycott, pro-boycott resolution, from being uncertain to being supporters. And this has happened increasingly. So yes, I agree, consciousness raising can't, uh, there can't be enough of it recently. Um, David Lloyd organized a conference at UC Riverside on the question of uh, academic freedom in relation to Palestine, Israel. And there were two rabbis in the audience who came up to talk to me afterwards. And uh, the shift that I see among that group is that they want to try to recover the liberal Jewish position within the United States, which I find really interesting. And that's symbolized by J Street. So they're not in favor of the boycott, but they're starting to feel the pressure to speak out in favor of a position that was also silent. Uh, and I don't think that, I think the time is over for that position to be effective, but I actually uh, praise the person who uh, belongs to J Street because they're trying to lobby the US Congress to put pressure on Israel to end the occupation. Um, they still want to support a state for where Jews have special rights, but at least they've moved. So I think the boycott campaign has made those Jews speak out to, um, so that they also feel that Judaism stands for social justice is not the way it's increasingly with Israel's government being seen these days. So I, I see that as, a, as a also a positive effect of the boycott campaign. Mm -hmm. I would just add, um, briefly when I think the the narration of one's own turnaround is really important and I really appreciate people who have been super honest about that 
I think about uh, Judith Butler, for example, who's, if you look at YouTube, I mean, there's actual video where she speaks publicly about her own resistance to academic boycott and BDS and what her turnaround was. And I think those moments when people have to do that kind of self-confrontation and self-reflexivity are really important because they show where the gaps are. I spoke with a um, sociologist, um, who I won't identify him without permission because he hasn't been public, but he said that for him, and actually going back to Nicaragua, I asked him how he did a turnaround because he was raised Orthodox and Israel at all costs uh, for all reasons. And what he said was that he was left aligned on every single issue except um, really in support or solidarity with Palestinians. And he said that year after year through um, you know, decades, literally, he said that he kept just pushing it to the side and pushing it to the side and he said it was wrapped up very tightly and he knew he had put it aside and he knew he'd have to go look there. And then one day he actually was willing to do that. But I think that's important work. Um, I think of Joel Covell's work, Overcoming Zionism, really talking about what it means to do that and, and the kind of confrontation, confrontation and rupture that it can cause people's lives. In terms of the, the um, consciousness raising and moments of identification, I would just add too that within the context of the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association, a lot of scholars, whether they themselves are indigenous or not, really understood, it really resonated when looking beyond the occupation to settler colonialism and the settler colonial roots of Israel and really pressing to think about Christian Zionism and how it undergirds all our laws in this country. I mean, Christian Zionist laws, Johnson v. McIntosh of 1823 has never um, been overturned. It's cited in every single native legal case to this day and it's totally grounded in the papal bulls. I mean, we're living by Christian medieval law to govern um, the domination of indigenous peoples here. And I think about Stephen Newcomb's important work of talking about it, not just as a doctrine of discovery, but the doctrine of Christian discovery. And that for that reason, the separation or the claims of the ch separation of church and state in this country are actually a farce. If you look at indigenous politics and indigenous sovereignty and land, and I think um, the other thing I just want to call attention to, again, thinking about who's being punished. Where is the punitive here? You know, we look at Stephen Salaita's case, uh, uh, the scholar who was dehired uh, a year and a half ago for his Twitter feed that had been uh, policed, really, and the Israeli, um, the supporters of Israel, the donors of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign that put pressure on the Board of Trustees to defire him. You know. You've got to make that link. It's people have rallied around him on the basis of academic freedom. He's called attention to the expansion of the neoliberal university. And then there's the Palestine piece, but there's also the American Indian studies piece, right? He was hired to be in American Indian studies. They were changing the name to indigenous studies. And it's his work that has really done the linkages between US and Israeli settler colonialism that are looking at that, that ideology, the political ideology of divine right as a justificatory a narrative for domination of indigenous peoples. Next question, hi. Um, hello, my name is Dina Ahmad um, at Yale University. I'm a PhD student. Um, thank you all for your comments and insights um, and also for being incredibly forthright about the limitations and the possibilities that BDS envisages. Um, so my question is related to something that uh, Lisa Buffel had mentioned about uh, growing up and saying uh, or characterizing their situation as something between Israelis and Arabs um, and how that maybe relates to the sort of symbolic um, uh, power that BDS has. Um, so I, as a supporter of BDS, I'm always struck by um, talking about it and then realizing that we do, like me and the person who may be averse to BDS or doesn't agree with BDS, um, we don't share the same grammar, right? And so I'll say, oh, okay, well, what about what's happening to the Palestinians? And then they'll respond by saying, oh, well, the Arab-Israeli conflict X, Y, Z, or um, uh, characterizing something that's happening in Jerusalem as, okay, well, pe kids are terrorists and they have um, knives and so on and so forth. And so there's kind of this strange um, uh, conflict of reality, right? And I'm just wondering how um, you guys have seen BDS 
sort of um, change the grammars and that sort of transform the symbolic violences in terms of the way we talk about um, this particular case. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. You pose an interesting and a, and a difficult question. Um, I think that from the outset, those of us who've supported the boycott of Israeli academic institutions have recognized that while we may or may not win in particular associations or while SJP may or may not win divestment movements, the very practice of engaging with the goal uh, of boycott or divestment is a means to educating people so that the kind of people that you're talking to have at least a window into the alternative world that they're so busy denying. It is also the case that um, there are people with whom one can have no dialogue. Um, and sometimes they call that dialogue uh, because they're not willing to recognize that the condition of dialogue is to stand off from the privileges that protect you from hearing the other person. But I, even there, there's some hope, ironically, because what is actually happening when people close off from dialogue is that they are following the logic of oppressive thinking and of oppressive practice, which is that as you get challenged, you have nowhere to go if you are not willing to stand off from that privilege, but into greater and greater rigidity and greater and greater violence. So that, that in fact, what we're seeing now in Israel and among Israel's supporters in this country is a greater and greater rigidity, which is not the sign of their power, but actually the sign of their weakness. So that retrenchment into not hearing is actually the sign of the end days, <laughs> if, you, if you get what I mean. Um, and so there will be occasions when we simply can't engage in dialogue. They will just want to shut us up or they will just want to shut their eyes and their ears. Um, but that means, in fact, that they are being pushed away from a position in which they have completely dominated reality and are actually being forced to confront for once what it actually looks like from the other side. I think in my experience that most people, as they begin to have to confront an uncomfortable reality, resist and hate it. Mm -hmm. But the discomfort is the beginning of thought. And for many people, that discomfort will not make them snail-like retract their feelers and go into their shells but actually become the stimulus to thinking of, of other potentials and other possibilities in their world. I just want to say something really briefly. David said it much better than I will. Um, I, I want to say one thing and then just uh, point you to a report that came out recently. I mean, I do think, I mean, as anthropologists, we think a lot about, you know, the notion of cultural incommensurability is, right, the radical alterity. And I've thought a lot about why we don't talk about political incommensurability. I mean, I think there are moments where there's a kind of radical impossibility that one's starting from these very different assumptions. And I think that, that for me, what BDS has done is gotten that argument out in the public domain. Mm -hmm. In a way, you know, when I first moved to the US, it was kind of stunning. I mean, I came to for college. That I, there, there was not only just no conversation, but I, I could barely tell people I was a Palestinian without people attacking me or assuming that that already was a political statement, an anti-Semitic political statement. And things shifted off and on over the years, clearly, but there has been a kind of dramatic conversation that has, ha that has emerged over the past several years. And sometimes, ironically, I think it's because the more that the, those against BDS attack it in public, They've made it a, into a bigger and bigger movement. In some sense, if they'd shut up and ignored it in the beginning, it might not have mattered. So just tactically, it was not smart. Um, but, but what I wanted to point you to, is, which I think is a sign of the impact this is having, is the, there's a group called Palestine Legal, which is a sort of offshoot of the Center for Constitutional Rights. And they recently came out with a long report, which is a documentation of all the legal cases that they mm -hmm. have been involved in that are in a, that involve trying to silence students and scholars on the question of Palestine, and a lot of it is focused on BDS. I mean, a lot of those cases. So students for justice in Palestine, they get shut down by universities, um, and it's kind of it's a it's an extraordinary report because it I think both shows both it shows both the breadth 
of a movement that this is, but also a kind of hysteria, the amount of effort that is going into shutting this down um, through uh, sometimes legal channels, Title IX, often by pressuring administrations at universities, is a sign that people are worried about it, right? Um, I, I really would recommend looking at that report. It's actually very good. If I could, if I could add to, uh, to both of the last comments, uh, one of the things that occurs to me is that this is where anthropology can really make a contribution. Uh, because uh, one of the things we're trained to do is to uh, be able to translate culture to those okay. who don't necessarily understand concepts uh, uh, from different societies. So, I mean, in, in, this, in this we have, I, say, I think, a very important role to play. It, I want to go back to Les Fields' question about um, moments of, of, of uh, consciousness uh, changing or raising. Uh, and I think one thing that, that almost everyone has hit on is the question of ignorance. And one thing that I've, I'm stunned to hear my colleagues say uh, over and over again is, well, I don't know much about it. I'm a Latin Americanist or, you know, I'm a Southeast, ask me about Southeast Asia and I, I can help you out. Uh, and it, it just on, on very, some very basic levels uh, having to do with the amount of U.S. funding uh, of the Israeli military and so forth. So a part of our task is, is on the collegial level and with students is to really overcome that ignorance that our media has done such a good job of cultivating uh, over the decades. And I think it doesn't take much to see for, for people once they have that shroud lifted um, to really start to speak a different language and to see things in a, in a radically different way. The other variable here that I think is important is that of fear. Uh, it's, I think it's much easier to be willfully ignorant if there's a lurking sense of fear uh, in, in the background. And there have been en enough cases uh, over the years for people to really um, understand that, although it's not something that's often talked about uh, publicly. So um, I, I would say that helping people to the extent that one can overcome uh, that sense of fear, which is often unspoken, is an important part of getting them to, uh, to speak that different language to which you're referring. I might just add briefly too, I was thinking about Bruce, Bruce Robbins' film, which you can see in its entirety on his website. It's called Some of My Best Friends Are Zionists. He's a professor at Columbia University and interviews um, artists and intellectuals um, who are Jewish Americans narrating their own um, break with Zionist political ideology. The other thing that I just want to go back to briefly um, and take the next question is going like kind of intersecting between Dina's question and the first question around effectiveness. I think that what, what I hear you saying, um, David and Nadia, around the resistance and being able to kind of gauge where things are at, depend, you know, kind of looking at the blowback as a form of measure, I think that's true. But also, I think anti-normalization work in general is hard to quantify. And so when I say anti-normalization, it's that refusal to just pretend everything's okay and that dialogue will take care of it. For me, that has included, you know, actually, as, and as an individual, if someone self-identifies as a Zionist, I'm already not gonna normalize it through dialogue. I don't have dialogue and debates with avowed white supremacists. Why would I with somebody who's another kind of supremacist? And so I think, um, the anti-normalization piece. We know what that's like in all different levels of the kind of pretend game that everything's sort of okay and that it can be rational. And I think this is linked to the, what you're raising, um, Roberto, around people not knowing. And I think that's part of, the, part of the shroud is that, you know, this is some ancient religious feud or ethnic conflict that's been going on thousands of years and how it's been able to mask itself as that rather than looking at this as a settler colonial project that mobilizes occupation in the service of settler colonialism, mobilizes apartheid policies, it's in the service of settler colonialism. And I think once we actually start getting at the roots of that, we have to actually deal with it here ethically as well in this land. Uh, hi, my name is Renda Wahde and I'm a graduate student at Harvard. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I wanted to ask if you could elaborate a little bit about Palestinian scholars who are housed in Israeli academic institutions and how the AAA boycott and academic boycott in general can actually support their academic freedom. Thank you. Okay, so that's always the thing pulled out of the bag. Um, well, first of all, uh, Palestinian scholars at Israeli institutions, which I want to know there aren't many of them, 
um, will not, nobody is boycotting them individually as scholars, and the parameters of the boycott don't change. So I don't, I guess I don't really know, I don't really know what else to say. Um, I would also note that Palestinian scholars at Israeli institutions, the majority of them that I know support the boycott, um, and it's not aimed at them as individual scholars. Anybody else want to chime in? Just one, one little thing to add to what Nadja said, which is that um, as with all Palestinian scholars, we should be making our best endeavor to bring them here, um, to fund them where possible, to give them access to our campuses and to bring them out to give talks and so forth because one of the most effective organizing tools I've found is to have people who come from Palestine, whether we're talking about Israel proper, as they say, or, or whether we're talking about the West Bank or Gaza, to have them actually speak at our conferences and then when we've arranged for them to come to make sure that they tour at least the region within which that conference is happening. And that's a way of offering support and making the boycott proactive and not merely as it sometimes seems something that's negative and prohibitive. Do you want to mention maybe Madara and Ahmed at the ASA and then? Oh, yeah, I mean, for example, we, we've had at the ASA since 2009, actually, Omar Barghouti, uh, Lisa Taraki, and Nader Afshahu Kevorkian, Ahmed Saadi, who's, who's at Ben Gurion. So that, you know, we, that was actually over, over five years how we organized uh, for, for the boycott resolution. I think for those of you who are concerned about Palestinian scholars in Israel, I would encourage you to lobby the Israeli government to decriminalize speech about boycott. Mm -hmm. That would help Palestinian scholars in Israel. For those of you concerned about Palestinian scholars in Israel, I would urge you to urge Israeli academic institutions to hire more than not even 2% of tenured academics are Palestinian whereas they're 20% of the population within the 67 borders, I would urge you to lobby those academic institutions to hire more Palestinian scholars. For those of you who are concerned about Palestinian scholars' academic freedom in Israel, I would urge you to lobby Israeli academic students, uh, academic institutions, to not criminalize their Palestinian students' speech about the Nakba, for those of you who are concerned about Palestinian scholars' academic freedom in Israeli academic institutions, I would urge you to urge Jewish Israeli scholars to start citing their work. One thing I'll add, when I went on the U.S. ACB delegation in January 2012 that I mentioned in my introductory remarks, we were primarily in um, East Jerusalem and the West Bank with the exception of a day trip to Haifa to meet with Palestinian scholars at Mada al Karmal, which is the only institution um, in 48 that doesn't receive, uh, the only uh, um, higher education institute, it's a research institute that doesn't receive a cent of Israeli government funding. And the five of us, um, we were hosted by Majid Shihade, who um, co organized the delegation, and he's a professor who's a, he holds Israeli citizenship as a Palestinian from 48, but teaches at Berzit. Um, he said, you know, you're going to be, you're going to be sitting around the, the board table with scholars who are Palestinian who teach in these institutions that you're advocating boycott for. And we were, and it was really kind of a, a switch because up until that point, most of us were board members at that, at that point, or some became board members after those of us on the delegation, and had been challenged around why do you support this and had to answer to our role within U.S. ACBE. But here we were being asked by Palestinian academics at the institution subject to the boycott. And, you know, they definitely um, put us on alert. We were on the defensive and we had to kind of answer to their questions. But as the, the discussion wrapped around, one of the concerns that they actually came to, and this was about a dozen scholars, um, which might represent just about everybody <laughs> in 48 in terms of how few Palestinian scholars there are, they actually said that one of the things that they were worried about in terms of the call, you know, the three prongs, the tenets of international law that BDS and, and PACB call into, um, you know, it's, it's a principled stance when I say it's grounded in normative international law, to abide by international law, whether it's around 
um, stopping the colonization, further colonization of lands, the question of deoccupation, the question of equality, and um, apartheid laws, and then the question of the right of return, all citing international law. And one of the things that came out of that long discussion was that they worried that it actually reified the existence of Israel. So they had a very radical critique, and they insisted that we go beyond, you know, people use deoccupation as a shorthand, even though BDS deals with way more than just occupation, but really actually really wanted to get at the settler colonial roots of that project. So their, their critique was actually quite radical in wondering of, you know, calling Israel into question to abide by international law, and might it re reify the actual state of Israel? Next question. Hi, um, my name's Susan Kahn. Thank you for your presentations. Um, I think I may be the first person to um, not be for the boycott resolution to speak here today. Um, I'm an American Jew. I wasn't brainwashed by my Hebrew school because I never went to Hebrew school. Um, but this, this is, and there, there's, so, uh, there's so much to say, right? But this is a point that, I, that I'm, I'm really curious about and, and hoping that um, the panelists can respond to. Um, as an American, forget as an American Jew, as an American who, where my government in my name has committed so many atrocities all around the world and been responsible for so many innocent people's deaths just in the last 15 years in the, in the so-called uh, you know, wars on terror. Um, sitting in, in, you know, an American university with all of the benefits and privileges that come with that, I don't know how I can't start at home first, right? So if, if my, if Israelis, if boycotting Israeli universities is going to um, help bring an end to, I, I'm not, um, I, I'm not, uh, blind to the fact, and I'm not, not acknowledging, and I've spent time in the region, that there are h horrible, uh, oppressive injustice, uh, unjust things that are going on on a daily basis, and people suffering on a daily basis in ways I really can't imagine, um, because I have, have a pretty good life in America. Um, but how can, I, how can we not start at home? Thank you for that question. I find it a slightly strange question because it assumes that working for the boycott of Israeli academic institutions is all that all of us do. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know why you assume that we didn't start at home. And indeed, as several of the panelists have already said, to engage in the boycott is to start at home because really the homeland of Israeli Zionism is actually America at the moment. Uh, Memi, in his wonderful uh, Colonizer and the Colonized, comments that every settler colony has a motherland and that that motherland is something that they have to imagine in increasingly conservative terms. Well, <laughs> we see that coming home to roost right now as Zionism and its uh, flailing attempts to beat the boycott movement has turned back to try to convert the United States into an increasingly conservative polity. Memi is so often has an incredible predictive power in his analyses. But the fact is that um, international solidarity doesn't work like that. It really is not about starting at home and then going elsewhere, starting at the local and moving out to the global. We learned that lesson in the anti-apartheid anti -apartheid movement in the 1980s when what we observed happening was that people who engaged in what had become a kind of moral struggle, uh, all politics in, in the United States seems to have to work through morality rather than political analysis, and the anti-apartheid movement was no exception, began actually to start recognizing that there was apartheid in American universities, and to a very large extent, I think the multicultural movement of the 1980s with all its limitations and faults grew out of the perception of apartheid on campus. And I remember being at Berkeley and watching the graduate students beginning to come to anti-apartheid demonstrations with those signs. So there's a kind of uh, lazy thinking in the idea that one starts at home and then moves into international solidarity because actually the process is, is reciprocal and always has been. And you know, our colleague uh, Robin Kelly points out this very, very powerfully in, in his, his analysis of the relationship 
of the black radical internationalism to the Palestinian movement. The black, ra black radical internationalism integrates with the Palestinian movement precisely because there has always been that transaction between contesting domestic oppression in the United States and mm -hmm. uh, you know, contesting oppression elsewhere, which the United States supports as part of the atrocities that you name. I want to just say briefly, I also, I think it's, I mean, I think as an argument, it, it is a sort of red herring, to be honest, because I do think the idea that we are not involved in other uh, political commitments and struggles is just not true. But I want to say two other things. Um, I mean, currently I'm actually writing a book on the U.S. wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, but I also think, yeah, the U.S. is, is not only responsible, I mean, it is responsible for extraordinary amounts of violence uh, around the world, including the violence that the Israeli state inflicts upon its population, I mean, upon the Palestinian population. And so this is, is a call for Americans to be held to account. Mm -hmm. And there are, there, are, there are movements at Colombia, and this started with, with the Second Intifada, calling on Colombia to divest as well. This is not just, I mean, in other words, let us be clear, in holding Israeli institutions, academic institutions responsible, one is saying that as academics we are not somehow outside of the social and economic and political world in which we live. And to make an exception of academic institutions and support the divestment from other elements of the economy is an incredible statement of privilege. In other words, we shouldn't be affected, but everybody else who, whose jobs might be could be. And, it is just, and we are doing it precisely because, as American citizens, we bear a very particular responsibility for Israeli violence, including as Palestinians who are American citizens, right? So this isn't just some random, I mean, not only, on the one hand, we're, we're responding to a call, which is a call for solidarity, but it's a response to a call that recognizes American violence in the world and recognizes how central Israel is to the way, the America's support for Israel is to the way in which not just Palestinians are living their lives, but the way in which the entire Middle East has been destabilized for 50 years, the horrors of which we see now, right? I would just add that I think that question, once again, asks us to make an exception for Israel. And I'm not willing to make that exception. I would just also add that the flip side of that same question is about assuming that we're exceptionalizing US domination in the globe. And I think the home, it begs the question of what constitutes home. And I think what the comments have pointed out is that Israel is part of that sort of starting at home because Israel is a client state. I find this question to be so peculiar too because usually what underlies it is sort of an implicit charge of hypocrisy and I always wonder what home people are talking about. I mean I did get at the actual roots of the domination of indigenous peoples in this country. If that's not home, you know we're on Cheyenne or Arapaho and lands and we're in one of the biggest Indian killer states in this country. This is a state of complete ethnic cleansing and indigenous removal. Um, you know, I always wonder, is that what people are talking about? So people want to, do people really want to attend to indigenous violence here? Or maybe occupation? Should we look at Puerto Rico, Hawaii, Guam, the U.S. Virgin Islands, American Samoa, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands? I do. You know, you want to talk about apartheid? Yeah, let's look at anti-blackness and incarceration. You know, so I don't know actually people in this struggle who aren't actually uh, committed to looking at all of that, including U.S. global wars of aggression. If I could just, if I could just add uh, briefly, um, and this, I, first of all, I appreciate the question because I do think it's important that we hear from from the people that are that are against um, the resolution and against uh, more broadly BDS. And I want to speak not just to the boycott, but BDS itself. Yesterday, uh, as I mentioned in my uh, portion today, um, our associated students passed. Uh, a divestment resolution. It was a difficult struggle, uh, and uh, it's the first uh, in the CSU system to do that, and hopefully there will be more coming soon. But one of the things I observed on my campus is that this was not done just in isolation. This was not a one-issue uh, 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 dialogue that came about, but uh, the, the reason it passed uh, was not so much because of, of, of Palestinian students at our university, of which there are a good number, or, or even 
um, uh, activist students, but students that um, are undocumented, of which there are many, or whose parents are undocumented, uh, our Native American students, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement on our campus. And what I've witnessed on our university was um, BDS serving as a kind of vehicle for the coalescing mm -hmm. uh, of these very different uh, organizations, most of which are dealing with issues here at home. Uh, so BDS, I agree with the other speakers, um, the other comments uh, that were made, we're deeply complicit in what's been happening uh, in Israel uh, from military support uh, on down the line. Um, but if you look at what's happening on the ground with the mobilization around this movement, it really is bringing home a lot of the issues, and, and this is the way organizations get built up. If, if you, if you uh, think about historically uh, about uh, coalition building uh, in this country and others, it's when people who normally are divided by issues, uh, uh, divided among different issues, start uh, speaking with one another and coalescing uh, and, and making things happen one step at a time. Mm -hmm. Just like at Wesleyan, divestment politics have been linked with prison divestment and fossil fuel divestment. So there's a three-pronged campaign, and that, that's the students making those connections, epistemologically and uh, politically. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, panelists, for your uh, interesting interventions. I particularly appreciate the personal uh, testimonies that we heard. Can uh, you speak up, please? Yes, I'm Dan Rabinowitz from Tel Aviv University. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of what has been said here I concur with. Um, the analysis of the situation in Israel and Palestine, um, I join them here. Um, I identify with Lisa's point about how the anti-Semitism argument is completely irrelevant. Um, and also the singling out of Israel. I don't think that it's that it's interesting intellectually or in any way contributes to this debate. I also uh, agree about the point that BDS has propelled the debate and awareness of Israel-Palestine in a very positive way. It's the leap of faith and logic into the boycott that I want to question here. And I will only make here only a, a minor point, not really a, a major one, but one that I think is worth thinking about. And, I, and that speaks to something the panelists said about, and many of, and more, th more than one of the panelists said about the distinction between individuals and institutions. I'm wearing a badge, and all of us are, which carries my name and the, the name of my university. This is our, this is, this is our tag. This is um, part of our identity, not only in this conference, but generally. It is how we present ourselves and how others perceive us. The promotion procedure and the credibility of our uh, universities seep into our personal careers and our, and vice versa. We build our universities in that way. So um, by boy boycotting our institutions, um, we are also creating a personal affront. It's part of our identity. I'm saying it in, in, in a, an emotional way. I'm feeling it right now. Um, and I take the point that this is not about our humble careers and lives, um, but I just wanted to, to note it and to say that this, uh, this is one of, the way, uh, one of the ways we have to complicate some of the uh, tenets of, of, the, of the boycott is, is this um, um, distinction between the individual and the, institu and the institution. Um, my question to the panelists, my uh, precise question is coming in a moment. I just wanted to say just one more thing to, uh, about this, uh, the need to decriminalize speech about boycott. It's unnecessary because speaking about the boycott is not a criminal offense in Israel. It was uh, legislated in 2011 as a civil offense, making it very easy to, for, for, one, for an institution or a person to, to, to sue another, for, uh, but, um, and, but they have to show that they had uh, financial damage from it. So nobody is sued, and it's not effective, but it's not a criminal offense. My question to the panelists, especially since um, the, the- We're over time, so if yeah. you could get to your question. Um, at 1.45 in this um, room, there will be a panel that would be presenting um, another point of view. Are any of you planning to attend it? Thank you. It is a violation of Israel law. I don't believe anybody said it was criminal, right? I did say decriminalize. Decriminalize. Yes, right. well, 
You could technically say it's not a criminal offense. I do understand what you're saying, but it has silenced speech, and we've had that report. Wait, excuse yes. me, excuse me. We're at 9.50, the session is over time. We're not in a place right now where we're cross-talking. We're gonna hear from the panelists who wanna to respond to this question, and then we'll adjourn. And for those of you that need to slip out now to get to another session, I wanna remind you that resolution two, which we urge you to vote yes on, will be presented tomorrow night at the business meeting at 6.15 in the convention center mile high ballrooms, number two and three. Panelists? Um, so I'm not really answering the question of am I going to that panel because I'm actually on another thing I have to be at. Um, but I want to say one thing about, I mean, as I said in my comments, and I don't know if you were here, clearly there's no way to completely draw the line between institutions and individuals. BDS has made, done as many backward somersaults as it can to not do what South Africa did. Mm -hmm. And yes, there will be a small price to be paid. And I think anybody who's progressive, an Israeli Jew who claims to be progressive, should be willing to pay a small price. The question of personal identification with one's university, I, I don't identify that way with my university. And it, it just strikes me that if, that, if you are that personally identified with your university, that this is somehow like personally an assault on you, that's something you might need to struggle with. I don't think that's the problem of, I don't think that's our problem calling with a boycott. That's a matter of really thinking more critically about your identification with your university. Thank you, Nada. I'm, I'm not sure that many of us on this panel identify deeply with our institutions. <laughs> that aside, let's be, try to be a little clearer about what academic freedom guarantees and what it doesn't guarantee. Academic freedom guarantees the right to research, publish, and to speak in public and to teach. It does not guarantee you personal comfort. It certainly does not guarantee you privilege in relation to other ethnic groups. It does not guarantee you the right to say that other people's academic freedom is less valuable than mine because it makes me a bit unhappy to be targeted by a boycott institutionally or indeed individually. To be a settler colonial person I know, because I grew up in Ireland as a Protestant, is not a comfortable position to occupy, and it takes some work to move from a settler colonial defense of one's privileges into a position where one agrees it is time to live with other people on equal terms rather than holding on to my privilege. Those are things that, that we have to do, but they're not protected by academic freedom. Academic freedom is very restricted in, in what it, in what it uh, respects. Yes, I'm planning to go to the book panel. <laughs> There's one opposing that. I'll be there too. <laughs> Please, we urge you to vote yes on resolution number two. Thank you very much for attending this session.